The title of the lesson is What is More Valuable Than Your Soul? First of all, some of you may not even think about your soul that much. What is your soul? Do you, it's part of your mind, but when you die, they can pull your brain out and it looks like a, looks kind of weird. You see in the movies, they show what brains look like sometimes. It's kind of weird looking. Yeah, it's like lasagna, but it's pale. And, uh, but, but, but what is your soul? Well, your soul is what uh, transports you to the next world. And you will be transported whether you believe or not. Uh, you, will, you will go on for eternity whether you're right with God or not. Uh, that's what people sometimes don't think about. You will continue to exist after this life. And God says, I want everyone to be with me. And the ones who don't want to be with him, he can't force because that wouldn't be love. Pure love is letting each person to choose yeah. unconditionally that I would like to, I would like to have a relationship with you, not yeah. be forced or, 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 or feared out or whatever. But he must tell the truth because he is God and we are not. And he is supreme and he created everything. And he allowed us to come in and gave us life. He didn't really ask for our input. He said, no, I'm going to create Wayne, and he's coming in. Amen. And Raylan and Travis and Woo. Vanessa. And By the way, I was just going to throw this out. I know you're engaged. Uh, the name of that address for the clubhouse is pretty good. You, you, you could probably use that name if you don't have a good name for Vanessa. Infectionately, Butternut. You could say, hey, Butternut. <laughs> or do you already have a good name? I mean, when you're engaged, you can use words like, hey, Butternut. You're gonna, you, 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 what time's midweek? Hey, Butternut, uh, how are you doing with your heart? But if you got your own name, that's fine. Okay, so look at Proverbs eleven twenty eight. Maybe I'll use that for Sonia from now on. See, either I call her you little raccoon or you little butternut. All right. All right, here we go. Proverbs eleven twenty eight 28 says, I'm reading from the NLT version on this one, says, trust in your money and down you go. But the godly flourish like leaves in spring. That's amazing, that version. But it says, you know, it says basically you trust in your wealth, you're done. Trust in your money and down you go. Uh, but godly, the godly flourish in spring. So now let's go to Acts 26, verse 1, and look at our theme. What, what is more valuable than your soul? Come on. Um, we're going to look at a meeting here that um, really, there's two hearts I'm going to look at today. And we're going to look at Paul before this incredible, the presence of this amazing king. On earth, he's the most powerful man at this time, so it would be like meeting with the most powerful person on the planet right now and being invited into his arena. But if you really want to see the hearts, this is really, there's only always two hearts. There's a heart that's responsive to God, and there's a heart that's not. And there's the heart that's not really indirectly, subconsciously says, I am the king or I am the queen, if you're a lady. You may not say, I didn't say that. No, but subconsciously, spiritually speaking, biblically, yeah. it will show you that's what God's perspective is on how you respond. Right. Let's look at uh, Acts chapter 26, verse 1. Come on, Chris. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies, therefore I beg you to listen patiently. So look down at verse uh, two, uh, 9, he continues to go, he goes, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that is possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went to one synagogue to, and to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blasphemy. I was so obsessed with persecuting them, I even hunted them down in a foreign cities. Wow. On one of my journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests, and about noon, King Agrippa, I was on the road 
I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting, said the Lord, the Lord replied. Now get up, stand on your feet. I've appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that you may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Here we see some powerful things. He's sitting here, and then first of all, he's humble, he's respectful, he gives the king respect and dignity, he knows where he's at, and just because he has God and that guy's not, he's very eloquent, he commends him and encourages him and and gives him credit for what he can. Respect is very important. Then we see uh, that he gets a, a God moment here. And, uh, you know, when you study the Bible and become a Christian, and you see the truth and start to respond to the Bible, it's a miracle. It's a, it's, it's a miracle. You can never forget that. The way Satan has lied and counterfeited Christ, everybody can just say, I can go to any building with a cross on it, and they can walk out of there pretty much told they're saved in some way, off the Bible, not off the Bible. Yeah. And they don't change. You really see the truth, repent, change, learn to pray, learn to walk with God. You didn't do that on your own. That's a miracle. Yes. Come on, Chris. And you've been now allowed to see the truth and understand that your soul is the most valuable. There's nothing worth more than your soul. Amen. Because now you've understood that Satan's had you held under deception. You've been controlled by Satan, but you didn't even know it. Because the Bible says here very clearly that uh, in verse 18, I will, uh, Jesus says you're going to open the eyes of people and turn them from darkness to light from the power of Satan to God. There's only two places. If you're in the darkness, you're under the power of Satan. If you're in the light, you're under God. So if you're a good moral person, but aren't in the light with Christ, you're under the power of Satan doing good moral things, thinking you're okay with God, and that's the deception of Satan. Yeah. Doing all the good deeds you can, and being the goodest person you can, apart from Christ, won't save you. All sin falls short of the glory of God. So then we go down to our theme and we look down at verse 28 or 27. He ends up saying these things and look at the powerful, persuasive faith of Paul. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think you that in such a short time you can persuade me to become a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today become what I am except for these chains. Wow. Now you got to break this down. This is a trip. Paul is a man that wrote in, in Ephesians, it says, make the most of every opportunity. He says that in Ephesians, make the most of every opportunity. Be careful how you live. Be wise in this crazy world. But he said, look for opportunities to give God glory. Here we see Paul making the most of this opportunity. What caused King Agrippa to resist and pull back and say, after he listens to this, and, it, and, and he really drives it home, he commends him, first of all, because you got to know, Agrippa wasn't, he, he understood. He was scared, and there was fear. And he, want, he ended the conversation. He had the power to end the conversation in that time, in that moment. God, God gave him the power. We have this old man in chains with really nothing physically speaking, visually speaking, would show that anything but just another old troublemaker. He's in chains and he's brought into the room with the most powerful people in the world at that time. He could have been so intimidated and he actually knows and he even reiterates in verse 3 
he goes, you know what? Especially so because you're so acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. He knew Agrippa was involved and understood behind the scenes the God of the Bible. Yeah. And so then he breaks down his own testimony. He's very humble and says, I was the worst of the worst in a sense. Mm -hmm. And he says, this happened to me. God has changed my life. And then he drives it home. King Agrippa, do you, in verse 27, do you believe the prophets and doesn't let him answer? I know you do. Wow, that's bold. Yeah. Your boldness coming up, that's bold. Yeah. I know you do. And then Agrippa goes, do you think in such a short time you can persuade me to become a Christian? And then he says, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am except for these chains. He's hanging in chains. Isn't that a trip? So what, what caused him to resist? His status, his wealth, yeah. his fame, his power, his life. Mm -hmm. he did, it was all more valuable for him. He couldn't see beyond the visual of Paul, even though it stopped him in his tracks and made him, he had the power to go, that's all for now. Yeah. But he, see, he had to make it all cool. He had to be cool. He said, you know, he had to bring it into an ending in front of his people because you're always aware when you're in front of your people, right? And you're like, yeah, how you doing? You know, that's enough for now. But he walked out. You know, I'm a, he, he, you know, he ended. Why'd he end it? I don't want to hear anymore. It's, it's really disturbing me. I want to go back with you out of my vision, and I want to remember that I'm king, and I got everything under control. Paul, Agrippa walked away from the encounter with Paul, and I believe he knew exactly what the apostle was aiming for. Yeah. I believe it because Paul said, I know you do. He just shot right out. His spirit's moving. I know you know it. Um, a witness is not responsible for the hearer's reaction. A disciple, a person who shares his faith with somebody is not responsible for the reaction, but only for presenting the person that's hearing it with an unmistakable and clear account of who Jesus is. Yeah. With this in mind, you need to recognize opportunities and learn to grasp them like Paul with clarity, courtesy, and conviction. You speak in a way people can listen, but you don't water it down. And you share about your, how God hits you. You don't go, come to my church. Church is a dirty word in this world. It's a messed up, it's a beautiful word in the Bible, but in this world, people think of church right away. Many things pop up from they raised, coming in, duped, false doctrine. You gotta go come and hear about Christ. My church preaches the word, people are open, and it's amazing what God is doing. Come to the church and hear God's word. Not just church. I'm not ashamed of church. The Bible says the church is awesome. And Colossians says Jesus is the head of the body, the church. So it's yeah. Jesus leading the church. But in the world, people just take church or leave it. Yeah. Um, but how do you express yourself? Look at Matthew 7, 3, and let's just set the stage to understand the worldly heart of Grippa is really the worldly heart of all those who turn down an invitation to become a Christian. Now you could say, well, I'm not as powerful as King Agrippa. Well, you are, if you don't become a Christian and make Jesus Lord, you're Lord. You might say, no, I'm not. My boss at my job's Lord. No, no. You think and do exactly what you want, even, even against your boss, because you have power in your mind to do and feel and believe exactly what you want. You could be in prison and still be king. Yeah. They can't take your thought process. They can't take your attitudes. You, until you change your heart, are king or queen of what you think and believe. Yeah. And that is is a right that you have, and that is something that you can change. King Agrippa said, I'm king. And see, until you become a Christian, you're queen or king, because you do exactly what you want to do, and you don't do exactly what you don't want to do. And, and even in that, you make decisions that hurt yourself, because you can't control yourself, so you make decisions that you regret, but since you're king or queen, usually our pride will spur up and we want to find someone to blame yeah. for the problem. Yeah. Even though you're, the, you're in charge. You, you chose to do this. Right? right? Yeah. 
In Matthew 7, 13, it says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few enter it. Find it. Only a few find it. Not every, and then look down in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, evildoers. I never knew you. The, the narrow way is the hard way. But it's not really hard. It seems hard at first. That's why most people don't go. It's the entrance. It's people calculating before they actually get on it. They're like, they're looking at it and they're hearing things like deny yourself, carry your cross daily, give up everything. I mean, I've talked to men where I've said, you can't, you, you got to be absolutely pure. You can't be sexually immoral or impure anymore. They're like, what? So that, that, now they're, the narrow way looks like, that's ridiculous. I don't want to be on this narrow way because they don't trust yet. They don't believe. So they're, they're, they're king and they're going, no, 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 no. That's not the way I'm going to do it. That's not the way I'm doing it. I'm going through the wide road. Everybody says it's all right. And there's a lot of people on that wide road that says God understands. No one's perfect. But see, they don't get in the narrow road, so they don't see the truth. The narrow, they just see narrow road. Oh, narrow road. It's going to be, people are going to get in my way. The wide road, many are just going, <laughs> many enter through it. They're not finding it. The narrow road, few find it. The wide road, many just walk, enter through it. Oh, that, look at all that. Let's follow the crowd. Come on. Anyway, how you doing? You want to get a cheeseburger? They're just walking right there. They don't even know when they're just, everybody's just, everybody's going this way. This is the way to do it. Yeah. Mom, dad, grandpa, grandma, all my friends, everybody, oh, look, everybody's here, man. There's clubs all along the way. We party. There's a lot of room in this road. This is awesome. Party. They're not even paying attention. Because they get to do what they want and there's no challenges. Against their sinful nature. Amen. Come on. Who was with King Agrippa? Well, let's look at verse, chapter, Acts 25, verse 23. See, something's only, only hard until you get involved. If you look at it from the outside, you're afraid. There's something causing resistance. There's a fear of losing something. something there's not enough value for you to get involved. See, when you get involved and you got skin in the game, you believe in the situation. Yeah. You're ready to fight. Right. Paul calls it a good fight. Anybody in history that stood up for a cause and put themselves in harm's way was ready. Yeah. I'll never forget one of those video clips of the documentary. Martin Luther King's talking and he's walking and something gets thrown. It's a ball or something hits him in the head or hits him and he, and he still keeps talking. He goes, that's all right. I've been hit so many times. He just keeps talking. Unbelievable. Yeah. You, have to, you have to get in, and it's got to be valuable to you. If it's not valuable to you, you won't do it. If, 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 you're not going to stand up for something that you don't will, you're not willing to die for. It's not worth it. You're a fair-weathered follower on anything if you're not all in. You're kind of like a spectator. You're in the stands. You're not on the field getting in the uniform. I'll watch, but I'm not really sold out. I'm not committed. I'm not really to give everything for this thing. And you know on anything where you stand or anybody where you stand. You can just think about an individual. You know where you stand. Most of us can say mom or dad. You know where you stand. You're going to get up in the middle of the night and help them. You're going to go stand in front of them. You're going to, you're going to go protect them. And I think mom and dad's going to go protect you. Yeah. They're not going to go, is it dangerous? Is it cold? Do I need a sweater? Well, I'll come over in the, when it's summer and help you out. No, they're going. Yeah. They don't even think about the situation. They think about the person. Right. How do you think? Mama. Acts 25, 23. The next day, this is, this is showing what the meeting looked like. The next day, Grippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking military officers and the prominent men of the city. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man 
the whole Jewish community has petitioned me about him in Jerusalem and, and here in uh, Caesarea, shouting that he ought to not live any longer. I found he has done nothing deserving of death, but because he made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. So, pomp. That's an interesting word. Pomp. <laughs> Ceremony on splendid display, especially at a public event. Today, you'd call a celebrity, they have great pomp around them, they have an entourage. Great, you know, it's usually the black SUVs pull up, guys opening doors for them. They never open the door, they get out, they got people around them, there's cameras shooting, they got their publicists. They always got a group of people walking around. Just pomp, falling everywhere you go, pomp. And look at Luke 14, 25, because here's the pomp. And you got to understand, see, he's a king, right? Yeah. Who are you? See, before you become a true disciple of Christ, which is defined by Jesus, Jesus never used the word Christian, but, but, Paul, but Agrippa said, you think you can persuade me to be a Christian? That's one of three times it's used in the Bible. So he knew about it, and Christian means follower of Christ. Disciple means learner and student of Christ. So it means the same thing according to Acts 11.26. It actually says that. It's a precedent that shows in the Bible, the Bible defines disciples were called Christians at Antioch in chapter 11 of Acts. So we know, biblically speaking, defined from the scriptures, to be a disciple would only then qualify you to be a Christian. To be a Christian, you need to make sure, does your life line up with the way Jesus defines it from the Bible in the first century, walking the talk, in a church that is set on evangelizing the world, unified with churches around the world, sharing money, resources, and people that we could, I could have an evangelist come from London and plant in here and take my place, and you wouldn't question it because you know he's taught the same thing in the same church everywhere, and he's stamped with approval because we're in a movement of God that teaches the same thing everywhere in every church. Amen. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, yeah. right? So we, it's like the military. You walk in, Army, Navy, you walk in, if you're in the military, you know you went through training and basic and everything. You're military. Everybody's green, Army green. There's no color. You walk in, a guy walks in with rank, you don't get to know him, you don't got to know him. He gets transferred, he's overranking you, he comes in, tan hut! Cap, you salute the captain, boom. You're not going, I wonder if he's, I'm going to get behind him. No, he's your new leader, boom. Because you know the army organization. Doesn't matter if he's Hispanic, black, white, and it doesn't matter, Chinese. If he's captain, you respect the rank, not the man. If In the kingdom, you respect the walk, not the talk. We don't follow titles we call faith Amen. and we follow teaching the same thing everywhere and every place Come on. see what i'm saying yeah. luke luke uh 14 25 says large crowds were traveling with jesus and he turning to them he said if anyone even you king agrippa comes to me and does not hate his mother his father wife children brothers and sisters yes even his own life such a person cannot be my disciple. You understand when he says such a person cannot be a disciple? People can even study the Bible and go through it and you get to that part of the scriptures and you already taught them that Christian means disciple and if you're not a Christian, that means you're not a disciple, you're not saved. In the Bible it says that, not me. They're going, oh, wow. Then you get to this scripture and you read that and you say anyone, Jesus says anyone uh, who, who does not follow me cannot be my disciple. And then drop down to verse 33, it says, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. He's saying every, any one of you who's not willing to give up everything you have, if it's in the way of being right with me, cannot go to heaven. That's what that means. Yeah. Not just, oh, I don't want to be a disciple. I'm like, no, no. To not be a disciple means you're not Christian, means you're not going to be saved. Right. You cannot enter. That's powerful. That's why, what is more valuable than your soul? Come on, Chris. Point number one. Is everything 
for eternity too much for you? Is everything for eternity too much for you? Well, you can go, what do you mean everything? I think I probably asked that when I became a Christian, when I was studying the Bible in 93. What do you mean everything? What's that mean? Break that down. I need to know exactly what that means. That's a lot. Everything. Everything means everything. It's not like a theoretical, you've got to read behind the line. It's just everything. There's nothing you're not willing to do in accordance with the will of God and God's call for us to be servants. He said, I'll turn you from the power of Satan to the power of God, to Paul. And Jesus says, and you are going to be my servant. So not just Paul. Paul's got, Paul had a special call. But all of us are called to be servants. You will serve my God. You will serve my Father. Well, let me see what they're going to ask me to serve. No, Jesus says, Mary had a little lamb. No, no, that's not the poem. We're not going to do that one. Gabriel come down to Mary and said, little teenager, peasant, no money, nothing. No one even knows where your village is. Oh, and you're not married. You got a guy you're kind of fond of named Joseph. But we're going to impregnate you now. And we're going to call the baby. We're going to name the baby. You don't get to name it either. And she goes, I will do as I will only be your servant and do as you call me to do. Wow. That's what she said in Luke. She didn't even go, wait a minute. What's up with that? Let me pray about it. Let me process it. Let me think about it. Let me walk around and what are you praying about? The word of God just came to you. What are you going to pray? The word of God just said this is what we want. What are you going to do? Oh, let me think about it. Let me pray about it. Let me get advice. What, what are you going to get advice for? The word of God just came drowned in you. Jesus says, go make disciples of all nations. You're a disciple. What are you going to pray about? Jesus said, give up everything you have. You cannot be a disciple. What are you whining about? You know what? It's, a, it's just being exposed. When you're called to live and obey God, it's not the issue or the situation at hand that, that's causing you to struggle. It's just being exposed that was already in your heart. Whatever the issue is that you're obstinate, resistant, it's always been there. And it's being pulled out by whatever the everything God's calling you to fit into his will. Yeah. You're not struggling with that. You're struggling with what's been in your heart ever since you became a disciple. You don't like it. You don't want to do it. You said you, you became a disciple and you're saved. You like that part. But the Lord part you agreed with, but you now are not liking it. And now you have a problem. Not with us, with God. So, and, and that's why once saved, not always saved. Look at Luke 4. So the king was like, dude, he goes, do you believe the prophets, King Agrippa? He goes, I know you do. That's enough for now. Do you think you can persuade me to be a Christian in such a short time? And he turns around, his pomp all starts to go, and the guards just grab him. He doesn't have to say anything. He probably just goes like this, and the guards grab Paul, and Paul's, he's probably walking away from Paul, and Paul's going, and they're grabbing him. He's probably, short time or long, I pray to God that you become what I am. And they're probably taking him back into the prison, except with these chains. And he's probably not even listening, but he's hearing. He's walking away. Anyway, how you doing? They're all smothering him. Hey, king, you know. Because that's way too much. That's getting way too heavy, dude. Trying to make me a Christian right now. I mean, what's that going to be? That means you're going to be like, are you going to be a disciple of me, Paul? Now I got to be under you? What the, I'm not doing that. I'm running. I'm over you. Luke 4, 1. Jesus, full of the Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. This is just after he got done fasting for 40 days. Hungry, vulnerable, weak, irritable. Anybody in here hungry, I promise you get irritable. Feed the person. Stuff something in their mouth quick because they're ready to cry and get irritable. I'm hungry, hungry. You're like, dude, just get out of the car and go eat. Call me later. I, I, I can't take the anxiety rushing to feed you. I can't do that. So stick something in your mouth or get out of the car. Because it's not my problem that you're all anxious and stressed out and irritable because you're hungry. You should eat <laughs> earlier. Right? Because you get irritable when you're hungry. Here, Jesus could be really irritable and I don't have time for this. I don't have time for this. Impatient, right? And, but, but, he, but then in verse 5, the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. 
And he said to him, I will give you all the authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it's written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So you see, King Agrippa and everybody else that's not on the narrow road, which would not be a true disciple as defined by the Bible, and I keep saying that because we're so programmed over this century of sentimentality and churches we come from and we grew up in, and when you read the Bible, you got to admit, if it's false doctrine, either the Bible's right or that church is wrong. You have to to look at the Bible and hold to the Bible only. That's why I keep going, defined as a disciple in the Bible. It's like, why does he keep doing that? Because people in the world will just say, believer, Christian, whatever you got. I'm a believer, you're a believer. You know, no, did, you, did you study the Bible? Did you repent? Are you walking in the light? Are you really, is it passionate about saving and seeking the lost in this country? in this world, in this state, and worldwide missions? Are you ready to do that and live your life for the next life Come on. and are you focused on the people that put chains on you and still care about their salvation more than yourself paul had chains on him and he cared for Agrippa more than himself wow. he had chains on and he was more caring of agrippa who had the power to kill him in chains yeah. he was more concerned about agrippa's salvation than Agrippa was that's, that's pretty deep and that's not Jesus. So you can't say, well, I'm not Jesus. Well, can you go for Paul? Because he was a murderer and a blasphemer. Can you try to come, become like a changed Paul? Sometimes when you talk to people, sometimes you get, you know, we, we've all said that or thought that in our little prideful, arrogant response when someone disciples you at times when you're not doing well. Bro, is that kind? Well, I'm not Jesus, okay? I wasn't kind this time. <laughs> well, we know you're not Jesus. It's very obvious. <laughs> it's been obvious to everyone for a long time. But now I'm glad it's finally been an epiphany to you. And now we can look at grace and motivate you how grateful you are to repent. But see, be like Paul then. Paul's the worst of the worst. And he's like in chains caring about the man who has him in chains more than him. Wow. wow. It's one-on-one Christianity. Come on, Chris. Talk about it. Satan can give you anything you want. Let me just tell you a straight up deal. If you leave God and go for this world, you'll probably initially be able to have a better car a better place and more bling and you won't have to worry about anybody bothering you calling you and you'll be you yourself and me you yourself and i you know what i mean me myself and i you'll be with you and as time goes the friends will be around you and you won't realize the now novelty because satan will free you for a little while and you'll think oh man and you'll love just being free in sin. And you'll try to keep the Christian perspective and try to be the good person. And you'll shop around and you'll plug into church for a little while. And you won't be, you, you, you'll start to tolerate. There's a lot right. The guy preaches well. Uh, forget about the altar call. I just, you know, I already got it right. Now they'll figure it out. You, know, you just start stuffing stuff out. Then, then you think you're going to be all pretty. Then you keep yourself all politically correct in front of everybody. And you look like, Polly purebred the Christian girl. But you're not right. Because now you're trying to earn it by your behavior and you're, and, you're, and you're putting up with false doctrine being taught in the place you go. And you go whenever you want. And you really don't make an impact on anybody. Because if you really think about it after a while, no one's doing any making of disciples anymore except for the guy that's calling everybody have done it. If you were moved by this message, come on down now if you want to be saved. Come on up. I know there's some sinners out there. Come on. Come on up. We'll pray for you right now. Come on. They start playing the organ. People start getting up like. And, and, and the loved ones around them are going, go, go do it. Come on, go do it. And they're walking up like. They don't have a clue what they're doing. They're just moved emotionally. Like, I love the idea and I want to do what's right because inside. Inside our inside, we want to do what's right, but evil's right there. Everybody has the instinct to want to do what's right. We just want, there's truth. We're like, yeah. You sit down and they pray. And they said, you, you pray and follow this thing and you believe this now. You plug in and you're saved. And they walk out and they feel great. And everybody's like, way to go, bro. You, you're right with God. Follow them for a month. Follow them for a week. There's no program or focus or purpose or understanding. 
It's just, I'm okay. Then they go on and they save people in Walmart in two seconds. Let me pray with you, brother. God, please, he accepts you in his heart. You're, you're saved. Go, find a church now. Find a church. See ya. That's what they do. That's what they do. And I don't mean to be funny because I prayed Jesus in my heart like six times. One time I was all blown out and blow all night. It was in San Diego in 2080. I mean, uh, 19, <laughs> it was like 1982. 1980, it was 1980s. The 80s were a blur. The 80s were a blur for me. I was baptized in 93. The 80s were a blur. But I remember all coked out in San Diego. Wired, so wired, and just so sick of my life. And it was like in the middle of the morning, and I was thinking it was the only channel I could get because I got the religious channels only at those times for all the freaked out drug addicts. And I spent it on this guy's like, yeah. and, I was like and I just was listening, and he says, You want to change right now? And I did want to change. I, yeah. And I just prayed with him. I just wanted it with all my heart. Because I, 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 it sounded, I really, my sincerity was all there. Yes. I believed in Jesus. Yes. But there was no change. It was a form of godliness with no power. Yeah. I meant well, but nothing changed. I didn't know where to go. What do I do? I'm still stuck with me in the room after he just, the, the TV program's off. Now they're selling a, a nail polish on that uh, QVC at 3 in the morning. And I still got a bong left. And I go, well, I, you know, one more won't hurt. You know, sorry, God. God, you forgive me, right? You know, I mean, it's just ridiculous. You see what I'm saying? Wake up! Wake up from the sick demonic lies in these freaking churches and realize it's so precious to be saved there's only a few in this planet that are saved jesus said that that makes you more urgent you're not better but you're saved and we get bombarded by you you're going to pass 10 churches on the way to lunch today big beautiful ones that are multi-million dollar projects check out their doctrines look on the internet call them what do you need to do to get saved know your doctrine know your doctrine so then you can know satan The difference between an optimist and a pessimist is that the pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity, while the optimist recognizes an opportunity in every difficulty. Amen. When Paul faced difficulty, he recognized opportunity. How do you do? When you face difficulty, do you recognize di more difficulty or do you recognize opportunity? I'll answer for you. Both. Because none of us are perfect. But what you want to shoot for is recognize opportunity. Amen. I had some heaviness going on yesterday. Just pressures. Church pressures. Situation pressures. And I just melted in my bed and just was really quiet and even told Sonia, I don't want to talk. Because I just didn't want to talk to anybody. And I laid there and said a weak sauce prayer and then turned on the headphones and watched some, I can't even remember what I watched. I think I was trying to watch some documentary, but it wasn't coming on. And I just laid there sinking in my sadness and my fear and my not being on the lead and I can't do this. Financially freaking out spiritually. Uh, just had some stuff going on in my life and I'm just like, and I just was like, it was the worst place. And I, didn't want to get, I wanted to emotionally, I wrote two texts to a couple leaders above me. And I remember Chad telling me, don't ever do that emotionally. <laughs> like, ding, 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 Then I'd stop and read it, and I'd hear Chase's, Chad's voice going, don't do it emotionally. And I'd stop and leave it, and I'd look back and go, wow, I'm glad I didn't do that emotionally. Because <laughs> you just shoot stuff off your heart so fast without yeah. spiritually thinking. You get just so emotional, and your fears are there, and you just want to, and it has an edge to it even when you reread it. And you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I've not. I just shot, I didn't, I, twice I did it, and I just, I'm done. And I just put it down, and I just laid there, and then I had a little pity party, I think. That's what I woke up this morning and repented. I go, that was self-pity, I think. I recognized that from about two years ago. It was seeping in a little bit, poor me. But when you're in poor me, it's hard to realize it, but it's just, it's a terrible feeling. It's just poor me, and there's no one here, and leave me alone. Now. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, but then this morning... As I did this lesson in Kids Kingdom, because I had this lesson made before the meltdown happened. It was, you couldn't see the meltdown. It just was a very quiet, undercover meltdown. 
too prideful to let anybody see me melting down. Uh, as I read this, it just it hit me again, like, no, I'm a fighter. I'm a Rocky, spiritually speaking. So are you if you're a disciple. And I said, I got difficulty. And I said, where is God? And then I even said to Sonia, I go, some of this stuff seems impossible for us. We're in a good place. I actually thought that way. It made me, it, it, it pushed me, but there's nowhere else to go. And I go, this does seem impossible. Yeah. Some of these situations like where I'm in. And then I went, a couple things. And I just felt that way. And then I, then I went, this is good. I don't have an answer. But when you're in an impossible situation and you feel that's a good place to be, even though it's a really terrible feeling, because then there's nothing to do but go, God, I know you can do anything. That, I got to wait. And now, now you wait for the opportunity, but you don't have to, you, it's not on you anymore. It's off you. I think that's what it means. I think it means cast all your anxiety on him. I think that's what was on me last night. That's another way of phrasing it. I, oh, I just learned it. I just learned that. Uh, that, you know, because we always go, cast all your anxiety on me. I used to think, I don't want to read that scripture because it seems like I'm a meanie to God. Here, you take all my anxiety. Get all my, I mean, I wouldn't want no one casting all their anxiety on me, would you? <laughs> Come on over. Here's all, but, but God's different. We think that way, right? I don't want to hurt him. I don't want to be mean. I don't want to be a burden. No, no. God says, cast all your anxiety. So when I realized that, now all my anxiety is on you and there's nowhere to go. So, but I know you, all things are possible with you. So now I'm, I'm willing and I don't know what to do. That's a good place to be, but I'm willing. Now I'm an optimist instead of a pessimist. But I was a pessimist. But there was nowhere to go because I've been a disciple too long and I've seen God do too many miracles in my life for me to get away. See, the longer you're invested in the Lord, the more when you think through it, there's no way out. Because if you really give your whole heart, time, money, and heart for 24 to 25 years, either you are really insane and you go, need to go to a mental hospital, or you really believe in the true living God and you've seen him in your life, in trials and out, over the time of fighting the good fight. The longer you live in faith, the more you see the insurance of God. But you can't do it if you're like, you, you got to start out strong. You can't, do it. you can't go to the gym two days and a month later go two days when you become a Christian. Jonda, when you get out of that water, you can't just be, you know, get down to that water and, you know, quiet time every so often. And I'm, I'm struggling. Well, we're going to go, of course you're struggling. Because you made Jesus Lord and you're not looking like it. But I know she's going to because there's going to be sisters around here calling her in love, right? Our car got broken into last night. That, wasn't, that's just, that was just a little bit of icing, but it just, we, are, we went to this park. We found this park with alligators. I got pictures, real alligators, not little teeny nightmare alligators. I found them. We went to the park in Titus. The, Titusville. The Titusville, and it was called the lake, the, the park on the lake, chain, la chain of lakes. And we pulled up. My daughter said, I really have a bad feeling about this. And she was like admonishing Chase and I because she was saying, don't do anything. And she turned around and said, if you get near a crocodile and get eaten, I'm going to kill myself. You know, she was just like, I mean, she was like, because she thought Chase and I were going to be idiots. And we might. He said, don't go up and try to get a picture with him. We, but, but, but then she said, then she said, besides that, I have a really bad feeling about this. I don't have a good feeling. She was very sensitive. Emotion. And, and then we walk away. And it wasn't just because she goes, I don't feel good about this. And it was all only us at the park. We walked around. Locked the car and went around, went to the lake, and we saw two crocodiles right there, big ones, just no fence, no one there. And, and then we, we, we're watching, and we go around the corner, and then the mosquitoes start eating us like crazy. So then we go, we got to go back. We go back. We get to my car. They go ahead of us. I mean, I can see them like this. And uh, someone had smashed in our side window with a brick or something, glass everywhere. And we got out so quick to see the crocodiles just really quick. They took my, someone left her purse and my wallet, and they took everything. And, and, and it was just, you know, that, that's fine. It was just one thing after another. And I would go, it's my turn. It's my turn. It, it's not like I was mad at anybody. It's just my turn. It really, it's my turn for a trial. It's my turn for a problem. And then when we thought through, we started thinking opportunity in that. We didn't even get down. My son was like, I'm going to find him. <laughs> where, where is he? Where is he? He's outside looking for him. No, no, he was going to find them and hunt them down. A whole way home, he's like, I go, Chase, and I'm just going, Chase, I forgive him. <laughs> he's looking at me like, you are so out there. <laughs> they didn't even, have, you know, he didn't say that, but he, you got to understand, the freedom for me was that I was at peace. Because, number one, I started looking at what could have happened and what didn't happen. I had $11 in my wallet. I know this. <laughs> I had $10, because I remember buying some, this, this uh, silicone. I had a $20 bill, and I remember that day, and I, and I got the change. I had like $10, $11, that's it. And I put the change in there. This watch and my ring was in my console that I shut, and all I had was my license and my credit cards and my 
cards to invite people to church that says Chris Klopek, evangelist of the Orlando <laughs> International Christian Church. A bunch of them. Then Chase is like, I'm staying up all night. Do you have a gun? I go, Chase, they're not, they're not gonna come to our house. And I said, I have God. And still, you know, I love my son, but when you say that, sometimes I just know you need more than that. But what I'm saying is that it did shock us and offend us, but then we just got the cops there, and even the cop came, and we were getting bit to death by mosquitoes, and I finally said, I mean, they were killing us. I've never had mosquitoes. I've been here two years, not like, I've ne now I understand. I mean, they were like on us. I was like, boom, boom, boom. And I just asked the cop, I said, you got off? And he just, yes. Yeah. So he pulls out this cutter. I go, oh, and it even smelled good. We were just shoot. I was like, I was like doing a clone. And I went, that's awesome. Because that was, that, that, the cop gave me some thing. And then we just took the report. And, and I just said, what could happen? We called our credit cards, canceled them all. They said, no one's charged. Boom, our license. He gave us a, a thing. And, and it worked out. We're just driving home with a smashed window. I'm going to have to pay for that. But it's a, you know, what could have happened? The car could have came behind us. We were the only ones there. It was right before evening. We could have been, they, maybe they had a gun. Maybe they would, there's so much more could happen. Maybe it happened for all of us to be together to see how we all respond. I don't know, but I had to start thinking that way. Otherwise, you just get angry and go, poor me. Yeah. Come on, um, so look at John 3, 19. We're coming for a landing here. But what I need us to understand is you got to understand that Paul recognized the opportunity and when he was summoned before King Agrippa, surrounded by his entourage, the king sat in splendor, probably on a huge throne and pomp and a bunch. I mean, that room was probably set up to intimidate. Like you're in a, if you go to a court, the judge is way above you. I haven't been there in a long time, but you know what I mean? You know, the judge, why does the judge always sit so high and look down at you like a little peasant? And then he goes, Approach the court. I mean, you ever watch TV shows? The judge is a powerful dude. If you watch any realistic law and order show or something, yeah. counselor. I mean, he just he has the, he's the power guy. Yeah. But this one, I'm sure it was set up crazy. He walks up, and before him, before the king in his splendor, stood the apostle in chains. In such an intimidating situation, Paul was totally unintimidated. Let me say that again. In such an intimidating situation, Paul was totally unintimidated. Come on. That's, the, that's, that's it. That's what got the king's attention. That's what the king was even nervous and didn't shut him down. He could have had his head cut off. He goes, you believe what I'm saying? I know you do. That's disrespect. He, he put that, I believe, and this is my opinion, but the king stopped it and let him go and walked away. I believe the king didn't know what to do, but he still had to hold his cool. Because Paul's presence and the presence of God in Paul, Paul was already gone that far, already been beaten down. His life has been risked. He almost died already. He's like, whatever. He just keeps going. If it's time, it's time. He's got nothing. There's nothing to lose because he knows the treasure of his soul. He's already given up everything. What do I got? Except these chains. Yeah, come on. And he had no intimidation. You can't buy that. You can't fake that. You can do it for a little while, but the veneers come through. You can act like you're somebody, but when you become nobody, you have a nervous breakdown and, and have a drug overdose. You see it all the time with celebrities. They are power until their next album tanks and they don't have a hit. Then you see them going crazy yeah. because it was a facade. How do you really be in the presence of anyone unintimidated without being cocky and arrogant, without being bravado? I'm, that's fear. That's insecurity hidden. But just have that powerful and intimidation. Why? Because his primary concern was not to save his own skin. Right. It was to save his hearers' souls. Yes. He had no self-preservation. It was God that had that. I'm just here to whatever the situation. If I die, I win for sure. Amen. Come on, friend. John 3, 19. On, this is the verdict. Light is coming to the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it might be plainly seen that what they've done has been done in the sight of God. You know, coming into the light it takes courage. It takes boldness. It's basically saying, here's all my imperfections and embarrassing things and really who I am. 
you show that up, man, that puts you, that puts you vulnerable. Yeah. And people may make fun of it and, take, and, and, and use it against you. Yeah. But that's, that, that doesn't intimidate you yeah. because you're with God. Yeah. You know, it says in the other version, this is the crisis we're in. God light streamed into the world, but men and women everywhere ran for darkness. They went for the darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. Everyone who makes a practice of doing evil, addicted to denial and illusion, hates God light and won't come near it, fearing a painful exposure. But anyone working and living in truth and reality welcomes God light so the work can be seen for the God work it is. Wow. Jesus appointed his disciples to tell everyone about him. We're disciples, church. We need to be telling everyone about him. We need to make this the year of boldness. We need to be telling people the message, and the message has not changed. It's, we need to have a courteous respect for the feelings and opinions and objections and misunderstandings of the people we share with, but we, it must not get lost in the enthusiasm and stress of the moment. You must stay focused when you share. And there is no substitute for the compelling simplicity. Don't make it all theologically dry and all these, let's go to Leviticus. Don't, they don't need that. God gave it to people who didn't read in the first century. Do you think they could sit down and turn to all these books to make a case? It's Jesus is crucified. There's no substitute of the account of saving grace in the life and the witness. Your, your, your life, your change, your weaknesses that you're changing is your witness. The power of Jesus. You could even say, I'm going through a really hard time now and it's really hard, but I have a faithful position because God has helped me before and I don't even know what I'm gonna do right now. I'm just being honest. We're sitting down, I'm helping you with God, but I'm just being real. I know God's there, but I'm weak. But God has got me out of it before, and I trust the word more than me. Amen. Boom. Just be real, man. But if you're not changing and you're in hidden sin and still in the darkness because you're afraid you're going to be exposed, you're going to come off weird to them. You're going to share godly truths, but there's going to be a weirdness. I hear what he's saying, but it's weird. Because you've got to be real and vulnerable for it to change. Weakness is the power yep. of God yeah. changing us. If you try to act too put together, it, it's nervous time. It's like this. I, I've been to a million churches like this. Everybody's all polished up. Yeah. This is what you need to center yourself on in the explanation. Who Jesus is. Son of God. God in the flesh. Come on. What has he done? He bore himself. He bore our sins in himself mm. on a tree, on a cross. So that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds we've been healed. That's in 1 Peter 2, 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. That's what he's done. Not the world, you. Just do it for you. It just only works if you go, he took my sins and now get real with the ugly stuff you're afraid to come out with and come out. What does he offer? Well... Let's close out here in Mark 10, 29. So you can say, who is Jesus? The Son of God, God in the flesh. He shows us how to have the great relationship with, with God. What has he done? Well, he himself took my sins and died for me. And that's why I live for him. Amen. What's he offer? I'm glad you asked. Mark 10, 29. Truly I tell you. Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. What does he offer? He not only offers life to the full on planet earth. But he, and he says you're going to get a greater family than you ever would have. Let me just tell you something. Nothing against blood families. Nothing against them. As you get older and you leave schools and you get out there, friends are going to come and go. You'll have your tightest little posse in school. School goes, you may still have those friends, but when you become a Christian, you, you'll find there's a, there's a lack of connection because you got deeper because God opened your heart. Yeah. It's nothing against the person. It's, 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 he can't, 
And then when you go on through life, you're going to feel like friends to really have come and go. And you got to go, who's helping me spiritually, not just comforting me? You got to have great patience and careful instruction. If they don't, if they're not disciples, they can't help you except comfort you. Yeah. But comforting you won't change you. Right. So your family, as you really grow with God, is going to realize that the disciples of Jesus around the world that are true Christians are going to never ever leave you, and you can get deep with them no matter what culture, race, even if you have to translate, you'll be deep. Amen. And as people get older, people die. So even as you get older, your blood family will die. And it'll just be you. But you'll always have a plethora of spiritual disciples growing and loving you. Young, old, middle-aged. doesn't matter. We all have the same focus. We're all completely united perfectly in one spirit. Isn't that great? Yes. So he has to offer that. And then he says eternal life. So Jesus demands first place in our life. So let me ask you, what... What can, what is more valuable than your soul? Could you imagine someone, well, and they start listing stuff off, my, my car, my house, my dog. You'd just be going, wow. A hundred years from now, tell me that. Tell me that, see if you tell me the same thing. To God be the glory, amen? Amen. Hey, how you doing? Thank you so much for watching the message. I really hope that God has stirred your heart in what you need to do. Uh, we see how Paul uh, was persuading King Agrippa, and that's what it really means. God is so patient, he tries to persuade all of us to understand the amazing, amazing privilege to become a true Christian, a disciple, and be baptized, have your sins forgiven, Received a gift of the Holy Spirit. It is nothing in this world you can understand until you have faith and start to obey. Then your eyes will be opened. The, the initial entrance looks narrow and unattractive, but when you enter it, you see the majesty of God. Because when you come into the light, you can't, I can't explain that either until you do it. I hope that this message helps you. And understand that don't be a King Agrippa because we're either a King Agrippa or we become a true Christian and we make Jesus our King and all of us if we're honest if you're not letting Jesus be Lord you are the King of you you make the decisions think about it you do what you want you go to church when you want you give when you want you share your faith when you want you don't do it the way Jesus wants depending on prayer so what is your soul worth? And you can take that to the eternal bank. Eternity is too long to be wrong. I hope you have a great week. Tune in next week. Same time, same spiritual channel. OICC.org is our website for more. God be with you.